In this video, we're going to talk about magnetic field intensity and why it's not very important in PMF therapy. You heard me correctly, magnetic field strength is not that important. Hello, this is Bryant Myers, author of PMF The Fifth Element of Health. I am a former physics professor and 25 year energy medicine researcher. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at magnetic field intensity because it seems that a lot of the so-called experts in PMF companies really don't even know what it really is. So let's start, what is magnetic field intensity? Well, before 1820, it was thought that magnetic fields only came from lodestones or iron ores that were magnetized either naturally or deliberately by man. But in 1820, Hans Christian Oersted discovered that really by accident, that an electric current going through a wire creates a magnetic field. And we can use the right hand rule if we put our hand around that current, the, your fingers curl around the wire, that's the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is literally circulating around the wire. So after this amazing discovery, Ampere, Faraday, and many other scientists went to work to really understand what was going on because this connection between electricity and magnetism was unprecedented. Now I won't go into Ampere's experiments, but here's the main takeaway. He found that magnetism is caused by moving charges and magnetism is felt by only moving charges. So if you have a current through a wire and a static charge, there's no magnetism. It's only when you have two objects with moving charges that there's an interaction with the magnetic field. Now from Ampere's experiments, it was discovered this magnetic force law. In fact, this is where magnetism is defined. It is the Lorentz force law that actually defines the magnetic field. So one of the units of magnetic field strength is called a Tesla. And because it's such a large unit, we usually use micro Tesla or milli Tesla. But again, it comes from the Lorentz force law where this is where magnetism is defined. So one Tesla magnetic field exerts a force of one Newton on a charge of one column moving at one meter per second. Now, one thing I want to point out here is I have a really strong 12,000 Gauss neodymium magnet. And it turns out what Ampere found is that permanently magnetized objects have basically currents that are perpetually moving. So also static magnets come from moving charges. In fact, we'll see next from circulating charges. So how do we calculate magnetic field strength? Well, we use what's called the Biosavart law. And it's this nasty little equation right here. So if we had a current going through this like a little wire here, and we wanted to know what's the magnetic field at this point P. Well, it turns out we use the Biosavart law and it'll end up being a magnetic field going into the board. Now, if we wanted to know the total magnetic field strength, let's say around an entire current loop, we'd have to integrate over the entire source. So notice, I want to explain something that's a big myth or a big lie in PMF. Dr. Pollock, Marcus Freudeman, Curatron, and some other companies say that it's an inverse square law in that you need more power or a higher intensity because low intensity systems won't penetrate because of the inverse square. Well, they're using the inverse square incorrectly. It turns out that when you integrate, let's say over a current loop, using the bios of art law, you get this little equation here for the percent drop off. And this is most certainly not a one over R squared. So it's okay if you don't understand the bios of art law. I just want to explain that a lot of so-called experts in the PMF community will say you need a higher intensity because low intensity falls like a one over R squared. And it doesn't because again, you've got to integrate over the entire source and a big coil is going to have more magnetism than a small coil because there's a lot more current and a lot more field strength. And basically there's a lot more of a field above as we'll see here in a minute with penetration depth. So from the bios of art law, there's this little constant called the magnetic permeability constant. And it turns out this is really important because magnetic fields, unlike electric fields, electric currents and lasers and light therapy, magnetic fields go all the way through. Your body is transparent to a magnetic field. And this makes PMF therapy, in my opinion, the best of all of energy medicine because it penetrates deeper and it doesn't get blocked, shielded, absorbed, reflected, or slowed down in any way. Because the magnetic field permeability constant of the human body is one, which is the same as free space, where with electric fields, it's 50, meaning the human body shields electric fields up to 50 times. And same with microcurrents. Microcurrents, you gotta deal with skin impedances and, and different types of resistances of the skin. Not so with PMF therapy. So again, Again, all magnetism comes from current loops and these are called dipoles because magnetic fields, unlike electric fields, always come in pairs. So for example, if you take a magnet and cut it in half, you're just going to get two more magnets. So now let's talk about something that a lot of the so-called experts don't really seem to understand. And that's the difference between magnetic
magnetic flux and magnetic flux density. So magnetic flux density is what we typically refer to as a magnetic field strength. But here's the thing, magnetic fields are only defined at one point. But magnetic flux is what we really should be asking these companies and experts about because magnetic field strength is not what you want to know. The number of Gauss or millitesla or microtesla, that's not what you want. What you want to know is what is the flux? Meaning, and I'll just give you a basic idea how you can calculate flux. Flux is basically the area of a coil times the average intensity of the field. So most companies will rate or tell you what their intensity is. Now let me give you an example to really drive this home. The IMRS 2000 coils are 121 centimeters squared, and the area is, that is. The OMI coils in their OMI pad are only one centimeter squared. Now, they rate their coils at 20 microtesla. If we turn the IMRS down to level 10 or 25, we can also get 20 microtesla. But here's the thing, even though this is 20 microtesla, and this is also 20 microtesla, this has 121 times more flux, which means 121 times more energy. So can you see how you can be misled with intensity? Intensity is not the most important or even the second most important thing in PMF. In fact, I would put intensity like the fourth or fifth way down the list. Yes, it's important, but you have to look at the size and geometry of the coils and how many coils and area is covered because intensity times area is what's giving you the flux, not just intensity. It's just as much about how big the coils are as it is the intensity. And a lot of low intensity machines like the IMRS and the Beamer that have large coils have plenty of intensity to go all the way through your body. You don't need high intensity. You need larger coils, a full body mat, tightly wound coils, as we'll see. Now the next important thing is coherence. And the only forms of energy medicine that have coherent fields that I know of are PEMF devices that use tightly wound, perfectly circular coils. And it's coherent because all the field lines are going in the same direction through the center of a tightly wound circular coil. Not a loosely wound coil like the QRS and Metathera and some others, but a perfectly circular coil gives you a, a very coherent energy where all the field lines are going in the same direction. Now to create a coherent field besides perfectly circular loops, you want to make sure, and this comes from the radiation formula, that you're using low intensity, low frequency PMF. So if the frequency is high or the intensity is high, you end up with the fields radiating away. And that's incoherent energy going in all directions. You don't want that. But if we use a low frequency, low intensity device, the field stays attached to the ring. It's called a velocity field in electrodynamics where this is an acceleration field. And this radiated energy that's from high intensity PMF devices will, is incoherent because it's going in all directions. You don't want that. Incoherence is entropic. Incoherence or decoherence is entropy and entropy is aging. So we don't want entropic types of energy. We want coherent energy. Coherence is health. Coherence is syntropy or negative entropy. In fact, it's actually like a pure magnetic field that's able to ripple. And I use a soap bubble analogy. So if you imagine blowing on a soap bubble and you blow on it just hard enough that it doesn't attach, you end up with a nice hemisphere type of soap bubble, right? Now, if you blow it harder, of course it detaches. So we want the soap bubble or the magnetic field to stay attached to the coils. And actually on static magnets, it does. There's no radiation from a static magnet. The energy stays attached to the, to the static magnet. And we can create that pure magnetic field from a low frequency, low intensity PMF device. So again, we want the fields to go in the same direction. We don't want them to radiate away. Okay, now I wanna talk about penetration depth because this is something that's very important. Penetration depth is an engineering term, and it's basically the distance with which the field falls to one over E. And I did the calculations with the bio savart law for a perfectly circular current loop. It's actually proportional to the radius of the coil. 0.97 is very close to one. So what that means is the penetration depth for an 11 centimeter radius coil, like the IMRS coil, is gonna be 11 centimeters. It's basically just imagine turning this into a sphere. So it's gonna be a nice hemisphere of energy that penetrates well into your body. Don't think that you need high power for penetration. That's not true. Penetration depth is defined by the geometry of the coil, not by the intensity. So small coils like this OMI coil here are just gonna have a little tiny bump of energy and that's hardly gonna penetrate into your body. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the coils in a PMF system. And this is one of the most important aspects of a good PMF device. The coils are the speakers. The coils are the broadcasting antenna of your PMF therapy device. And if you don't get this right, you're not gonna get a good signal transmitted into your body. So here's what you want. You want a perfectly circular coil that's tightly wound 
that has hopefully several turns because that helps to increase the flux. Made of pure copper of a decent gauge. You don't need really thick copper, but you do want it to be thick enough. And you certainly want a full body mat and you want some local applicators to work on local areas. But they should all be perfectly circular, tightly wound coils. Because again, magnetic fields come from circular current loops. So before we talk about Faraday's law, let's just kind of take a step back and say, okay, what are we trying to do with PMF therapy? You know, everybody's talking about intensity, not really knowing what the ultimate goal is. I mean, let's just back up and say, what are we trying to do before we just talk about, oh, you need higher intensity, which of course is wrong. And the goal, uh, there's two goals, and I, this comes from me pouring through a lot of research literature to try to summarize the main two effects of PMF therapy. So the first goal is to induce healing microcurrents in the body, organ, tissues, and cells. And we do this through Faraday's law of induction and magnetic resonance. So now it turns out induction, which is Faraday's law, and here's the wonderful equation here. And this, is, this basically says that the EMF, which is the voltage that's induced, is equal to the minus, that's from Lenz's law, change of flux over time. But just know that there's three components to it. The first is the area of the coil, because again, flux is magnetic field times area. So we gotta look at the area of the coil because along with intensity, that'll tell you how much flux there is. And of course, intensity is one third of it, but only one third, and how quickly the signal changes. I've done other videos where I've talked about a square wave and a sawtooth and how those are two of the best signals for a rapid rise and fall. But essentially how quickly a signal rises and falls is due to how steep the slope is here. This is called the rise time and the fall time. And so the quicker the rise time, the steeper the slope and the more induction you get. I tell people it's kind of like swiping a credit card. You want to swipe it quickly. It's like when you strike a match, you strike it abruptly, right? So same principle here. We don't want to just go back and forth like a sine wave. So a sine wave is an example of a signal that will not induce much current. So let me give you an example. The biobalance uses modulated sine waves versus say the IMRS sawtooth. Now I'm gonna show you an image here on my oscilloscope. Even though this is five gauss and this is 0.7 gauss, interestingly the magnetic fluxes are about the same. But the amount of induction is four times greater in the IMRS than it is in the biobalance. And how is that possible? Because induction comes from these three factors. It's not just intensity. This is a small coil in a poor waveform. So even though it has a higher intensity, it's not going to induce as much current in your tissues because it doesn't have a large coil and it doesn't have a rapid rise and fall signal like the IMRS does. I tell people the signal is the music of a PMF device. It's the secret sauce. It's the heartbeat. So that is where all the magic is at, not intensity. So like I said, the key to PMF is how much voltage is induced. Like I gave you the, the example of the biobalance and the IMRS. So this is how you want to really be measuring the signal and the intensity is how much voltage is induced on an oscilloscope. And what does the waveform look like. And you want to use a near field probe because you want to know the energy in the field. You don't want to put the probes on the current. So this, this is really important and nobody's testing PMF devices properly. So I'm going to put on the screen here a couple examples of some good signals that have a nice rapid rise and fall. They're clean and coherent and they induce a really good voltage. The first is the IMRS here. Again, you can see the sawtooth. It's got a nice voltage, like 75 to 80 microvolts induced in my near field probe, which is four times what the biobalance is doing. Another is the IMRS square wave. You can see that again, very nice induced voltage. The QRS and the Metathera and the Beamer also have very nice waveforms where they have a nice inductance. They got a nice Nice rapid rise and fall signal and as we'll see next all those signals that are good that I mentioned have a broad spectrum of frequencies on a spectrum analyzer and that's also very important so now this video is more about magnetic field intensity but I just want to mention in closing that resonance is the second goal of PMF so I would say the second goal is to increase cell tissue, organ, and body-wide voltage via magnetic resonance. And there's these new wireless power transfer systems like Witricity that is technology proving what I've been saying for 12 years, that more is not better. It's more about frequency resonance. In the case of Witricity and PMF therapy, it's magnetic resonance. And what Witricity found was their equations for power transfer depended on the size and geometry of the coils, the distance of way, and the magnetic resonant frequencies. Intensity wasn't even part of the equation. So another example showing the power power of resonance over intensity is the Pioneer 10. The Pioneer 10 in 2003 transmitted its last signal outside the orbit of Pluto, 7.6 billion miles away using an eight watt transmitter. We were able to pick up that signal. How is that possible? Resonance. So to accomplish frequency resonance, there's really three things we want to look at with regards to frequency in a PMF signal. So the first is repetition rate, which we want ideally to be zero to 50 hertz. And that's the frequency of the pulses in a PMF system. And they can be non-sinusoidal pulses like a square wave or a sawtooth. The next component to frequency is the spectral content. 
And this we'll see on a spectrum analyzer. That's gonna show you the range of frequencies that are present in a good PMF system. And really good systems like the IMRS and Beamer, as one independent study showed, they had the best frequency spectrum, just a very broad spectrum of frequencies that blankets the biologically active range and includes higher frequencies for the sharp edges for inductive effects. I tell people it's kind of like an energetic multivitamin. You want a signal that's got a broad spectrum of frequency so that all your tissues and cells can resonate to whatever frequency they need. Whatever they don't use just passes right on through because every person is different. And then the third component of frequency is you do need higher frequency. So some of these videos pointing out like that the IMRS and maybe some other devices have high frequencies, that's actually a compliment because the higher frequencies are what creates the sharp rise and fall time. It's called slew rate. You can't get a high slew rate with low frequencies. In fact, in high definition music and high definition television, it's the higher frequencies that give you a clear picture. So you do need those higher frequencies, but interestingly, in the, like the IMRS and Beamer, those higher frequencies are very low amplitudes, but they need to be there for the inductive effects. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do subscribe to my channel and leave some comments and have a great rest of your day.